I've worked security for most of my life, a fair chunk of that being overnight work. Sometimes people ask me where the craziest place I've worked is, or where the easiest place I've worked is, or what the scariest on the job moment has been. Strangely enough, the answer to the second two questions is the same place, and folks are always surprised to hear it. Because I honestly think the best security job I ever worked was the overnight shift at a funeral home. Some people think I'm crazy for saying that, all alone in the middle of the night with nothing but dead bodies to keep me company. But as long as you don't believe in ghosts or any of that stuff, the job is a walk in the park. Nobody in their right mind wants to break into a funeral home in the middle of the night, not to say that they didn't have some pretty valuable stuff on site. Some of the caskets went for eight to nine thousand dollars. But again, only the crackiest of the crackheads would be so without crack that they'd try to steal a fur-lined coffin, and they'd have to be built like Shaq to do it. So, since I certainly didn't have to worry about anyone breaking out of the funeral home, I basically had nothing to do. I guess the funeral home just chalked me up as an expense, something to reassure the relatives of the deceased that they were being properly watched over or whatever. But I'm serious. Aside from the odd walk around, all I did was watch TV and lift weights. But ironically enough, it was at this cushy security job that I had the creepiest encounter of my entire life. I was about six months into the job and aside from the whole overnight thing, I was loving every second of it. I started learning Spanish to try and impress this Dominican chick that I was vibing with so I spent most of the first night walking around with my headphones on, repeating Spanish phrases to absolutely no one. So at one point, I'm sitting in the manager's office, which is where their bank of security monitors were, and I casually look over to check if they're all clear. Now keep in mind that all of the times that I've looked at those monitors over the past six months, the most I've seen was like a fox. The rest of the time, they've been totally clear of any activity, either animal or human. Only this night, as I'm trying to understand the Spanish verb to be, I see someone standing perfectly still in the parking lot of the funeral home. The sight instantly gets this, what, reaction out of me. Not because I was seeing someone for the first time, but because they were just standing there, perfectly still, and just staring at the building. He was so still for so long that if it wasn't for the clock numbers ticking away in the corner of the screen, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the picture had frozen. But then he moved just shifted a little, and I realized he was really just standing there like a statue, eyes glued to the funeral home. It was real cold out that night, so I put my jacket, hat, and gloves on in preparation for going outside to warn the person off. Then just before I walked out of the office, I checked the screen again. Nothing. There was no longer anyone standing there. Best case scenario, it was just some drunk that moved on. Worst case scenario, it called for a sweep of the entire exterior. I walked out into the parking lot, but I don't see anyone. But just because I didn't see him didn't mean he wasn't there, so I commenced on checking around the building to make sure Statue Man isn't fixing to start trouble. I'm shining my flashlight, seeing nothing, then when I check around back to where the fire door was, I hear some scampering sound followed by quick footsteps. This SOB must have seen my flashlight beam before I turned the corner and just up and ran off before I could get to him because when I turned the corner, all I saw was some hooded figure beating feet about 50 yards away from me. Remember what I said about the crackiest of the crackheads needing crack so bad that they rob a funeral home? Well, that's what I figured it was, and since I don't mess with no crackheads, I just went right back inside, made sure the rear door was secure, then called the cops to file a report. I didn't need a unit sent over or anything, I just wanted them to have something on file for next time I called because I had this bad feeling that I'd be calling them back about this guy very soon. And I was right. The second time I caught the guy sneaking around, he was much more ballsy about it. I stopped listening to my Spanish lessons at work and for good reason because the next time the guy visited, I heard him before I saw him. He tried to open up the front doors, bold as brass and first time I heard the faint sound of them refusing to open as the manager's office was almost straight across from the entrance. But then the second time, at which point I knew something was wrong, was when the guy violently tried to rip the doors open or something because I heard this almighty crash before I ran to see what was going on. 
Now the funeral home had two sets of frame glass double doors, meaning you could look right through each way. I didn't see the guy's face very well, but he sure saw mine, and just like the first time I caught him, he just ran off into the night. The same thing kept happening for weeks on end. At first, once a week, then sometimes twice a week, then by the end of it all, I was having to chase this guy off three times a week sometimes. I called the cops every single time, giving the best description I could, but they never got back to me saying that they picked anyone up or noticed anything during their patrols. I'm not sure what they were looking for, or if the guy kept off the roads to stay low-key, but it is what it is, I guess. I was there just to do my job and protect the dead people. It didn't scare me or anything, it was just incredibly annoying to be honest. I had this incredibly cushy job, and this creepy guy keeps showing up and forcing me to actually do my job. I know, I knew, hardly seems like a monster, but you just wait. But I haven't even gotten to the creepy part yet, which happened way at the end of the whole midnight visitor saga. So, the last time the guy showed up, I expected it to go down just like all the other times. I saw him on the camera, standing totally still in the parking lot, just like the first time I'd spotted him. He did that a lot, by the way, especially when he finally figured out that he just couldn't break in, but every time I walked out to shoo him off, he'd always run away before I could say a word to him. Only this time, the final time, as I walk out of the office and he spots me through the glass doors, he doesn't run, he doesn't move, he just stares me down as I walk out into the dark parking lot. Now don't get me wrong, the sudden change of tactics definitely made me a little nervous, and I started to worry if he had some kind of weapon on him. But just the chance of being able to ask the guy why, after weeks and weeks of crazy curiosity, I just couldn't find it in myself to pass that up. I didn't walk up to him or anything, I just stepped out of the double doors and into the dark parking lot, watching as he stared back at me from under his hood. That's when I first realized how young the guy actually was. I mean, he looked like a kid but just from the size of him and the patchy facial hair, you could tell that he was late teens or maybe early 20s. He also wasn't mad-dogging me like I thought he would be either. He looked kind of sad and tired as I stared back at him. A few seconds or so passed before I finally asked him why he kept showing up there in the middle of the night. He didn't say anything in reply, but, and I know this sounds a little out there, but it was like he was trying to talk, but he just couldn't. I figured that he might be a little slow or something. He definitely didn't look like a crackhead, so when it turned to look like I was going to be the one doing all the talking, I just rolled out the rest of my piece. I told him that he needed to stay away from the funeral home, that I was running out of patience with him, and if he showed up again, I was going to catch him and beat him down. I wasn't too aggressive about it. It came out more like a friendly warning, but still the guy didn't say anything and he just looked back at me, still seeming all sad. I figured that I'd try just once more to talk to him and if he didn't want to talk back, I'd just go inside and call the cops like usual. I honestly didn't bet on him piping up that time either, so I asked the most fundamental question in my mind. Why? Why keep showing up week after week trying to get into a funeral home at night? But again, nothing. At least until I turned to walk back into the building because that's when the guy finally found the words to tell me what he wanted and I'll be cold in my grave before I ever forget what he said. I just... He started off and then paused, and as you can imagine, I immediately spin around to hear him out. Then after a few seconds, all he says, I just want to touch one. I knew what he was talking about right away. I just didn't want to believe that that's what he was talking about. So, I asked him, straight up, touch one of what? I knew what he was talking about and he knew that I knew what he was talking about, but he just didn't want to say it. And as much as I tried to squeeze it out of him, he knew better than to actually come out and tell me what he wanted to touch, or more accurately, who he wanted to touch. When I realized he wasn't going to say it, I told him to get help and that I was going inside to tell the cops exactly what he told me, including the implication. I also threw in that if I ever saw him hanging around the funeral home, or any other kind of place for that matter, I was going to beat him until we walk like Donald Duck. The guy looked like he was trying to say something, and I gave him a minute or so to get it out, but he couldn't, so I went back inside to call the cops. 
The guy never showed up again, and that really was the last time, and I'd like to think it was all me keeping it gangster that scared him off, but I get the feeling that he'll just try another funeral home and another and another until he finally gets what he wants. I used to work night shift at UPS as a security guard. The security shed was at the entrance of the gate to make sure no one could get into the facility. The job wasn't hard, I was mostly checking seals on semi-trucks coming in and when the shifts changed, i check in and out the package handlers working inside the facility. Package handlers would have to walk through a metal detector and scan their ID cards in order to enter. Their ID would make a green light go off when they scanned in and we let them pass. If they didn't have their ID that day, they had to wait with me and my co-worker while one of us contacted a supervisor or HR to let them in. One night, my co-worker and I just finished up checking in and out of the shift change. I was about to do our hourly parking lot checks when I saw someone approaching the shed. I yelled out, late today, and he said, yep, and I walked back to help my coworker check him in. I don't know why I walked back in. My coworker could easily check in one late person by himself, but maybe because I yelled out to him, I felt obligated to finish our conversation. When the late guy walked in, I noticed that I'd never seen him before, but new people come in all the time, so it wasn't a big shock. As he scanned his ID, I noticed for the first time ever that the green light showed up and followed by a loud buzz, shocked because I'd never seen an ID fail. Then, as he passed through the metal detector, it went off near his hip. He showed us his belt buckle and said, it must be this. Protocol when the metal detector goes off is the person removes what is setting it off and tries again, and if it is a belt buckle, they need to empty all their pockets. Against protocol, my coworker lets him in after he removes only his front pockets, but since his ID failed, we couldn't let him in anyways. So my coworker lets him sit down in the shed with us while I call a supervisor. None of the supervisors answered their phones, probably because a shift just started and they were busy organizing workers. A few futile calls later, the late guy said, Hey, I'm going to be super late, can I just go in? I said that he couldn't because I could get fired. He said, no one's going to know. But then I pointed up to a camera in the corner of the shed looking at us, and his face almost jolted to look at it. I told him that I would try HR. The night shift HR was a pretty cool guy that would shoot the breeze with us on our breaks. He told us that a night shift HR worker is pretty much just a human complaint box. People just go to him to complain about other people. When he answered his phone, I asked him if he could come out and check the late guy in. He said that he was talking to someone and if I could just tell him his name and the ID number. I gave him the name and number on the late guy's card and HR told me that he'd get back to me. While we waited, the late guy asked us if we'd ever seen anything crazy while working. I told him no and my coworker told him a story about a guy with a hatchet in the parking lot. I got a call from HR and when I heard what he had to say, I almost froze. HR told me that the late guy was actually an ex-employee. He was fired because he was involved in a violent altercation with a supervisor. HR told me to ask him to leave and to call the cops if he didn't. I didn't know what to say, so I made up a lie that there was only a new supervisor working tonight and no one could verify if he worked there. He then said, well, Let me go get some coworkers. They know so they can tell you I work here. I again pointed to the camera and said that if it's not a supervisor, I would get in trouble. He then said, well how will I get paid? At this point, I know he doesn't work here anymore so I told him that I would inform them that he showed up to work and that they will pay him for a full day without him even having to actually work. Clearly frustrated and out of excuses, he got up and left. As he left, I noticed something in his back pocket, something that looks like the shape of a small firearm or knife, definitely not a phone or wallet. And the rest of the night was normal. The next day I came to work and my supervisor was there to greet me. He shook me in my coworker's hand and said, good job. He informed us that the guy from last night came back in the morning and crashed his car through the gate. I guess he was high on something so when he crashed, he went unconscious for a while until the cops showed up. They searched his vehicle and found weapons and duct tape and a shovel, pretty much a murder kit. He was arrested 
and I never heard anything from it since, and I quit only a few weeks later. I still can't believe I sat in a room with a would-be murderer for over 20 minutes, and I wonder what would have happened if I just let my coworker check the guy in late by himself. Before I well and truly retired, I worked a security job at a set of storage units just outside of Tucson, Arizona. I'd just finished a 37-year stint as a sheriff's deputy, so I walked onto the job, and I honestly thought that it would be an easy way to pad my bank account until I was too tired to work anymore. Turns out, it was much more eventful than I'd figured. I didn't mind working nights much, that's part of the reason the boss man hired me. I didn't have a reason to be up in the daytime anyways, not since my wife passed away and my son moved his family out to California. I hate to put a downer on it like that, but the truth is the truth. Plus, it made sense to have someone with instincts and experience guarding the units at night, and they were much less likely to get robbed. So, that's how I started working nights, four days on, four days off, on what were some of the most tedious shifts I'd ever worked. For a long time, the most exciting thing that happened to me was coming face to face with a trio of coyotes. We just stared at each other for a little while until the coyotes decided to move on. And moments like that made it fine work in a way. Moments of nocturnal solitude. All that peace and stillness after so many years of pedal to the metal. But then there was one time when my peace was disturbed by the kind of thing that prompted my retirement from law enforcement in the first place. I thought I'd escaped the terrible evil that man is capable of inflicting on his fellow man. But instead, it came following me. One night, at around two in the morning, a group of men came walking past the site's small office. The office was right next to the site's front entrance, meaning you could see everyone coming and going from a large window near the door. As the group passed the window, one of the men looked inside and made eye contact with me, and the next thing I know, he's knocking on the door to the office and letting himself in. He was well-dressed, around 30 years old, sounded Hispanic but spoke excellent English, and at first... I was taken aback by how downright friendly he was. He greeted me, asked me if I was the site's security guard, then when I said yes, he acted like it was some kind of high position. I'd have thought that he was being patronizing if it wasn't for the fact that he was so endearing. He told me his name was Manalo, and then he and his friends would be conducting a little late night business in one of the storage units. I joked that I hope it wasn't anything illegal which prompted raucous laughter from Manalo before he assured me that no such activity was taking place. He told me that he and his friends owned Lot 36, and that they were in the antiques business and that they specialized in pieces of the Spanish colonial period. Now, I love my history, and I just so happened to specialize in the Spanish conquest of Southern and Central America. I ended up asking Manalo about some of the pieces he kept on the lot, and he seemed to know an awful lot about his business. He also seemed to share my passion for regional history too, and when he professed to know who Bernal Diaz del Castillo was, I was truly impressed. The site had a small waiting room in the office, complete with a water cooler and a coffee machine for current and prospective customers, and a few minutes into our conversation, Manalo asked if I wanted a cup of coffee. He sympathized with me being up so late and waxed on lyrical about how it must wear me down being up all night. I told him it wasn't too bad and that it was nice that he offered, and then we got back to talking history. We chatted back and forth for maybe 30 to 40 minutes, and I gathered that Manalo was a very intelligent and very wealthy man. He didn't explicitly talk about his wealth, but I started to notice how expensive his watch looked, and the numbers he threw around when talking about certain rare furniture pieces were five and six figure numbers. But anyway, as I was saying, we talked for a while, and I'm enjoying our conversation, when suddenly Manalo's friends show up and knock on the door. He excuses himself, tells me he has to leave, but shakes my hand very sincerely while thanking me for the stimulating conversation. I walk him out of the office, wish him a good night, then turn around to walk back inside, when the cop in me suddenly realizes something. Police work, especially detective work, is all about details. You learn to notice things, be they differences or numbers or routines and such, it's something the department drills into you and it's something that never goes away once it's there. Walking onto the site, Manala was accompanied by four of his so-called partners. When they were leaving, 
he was only accompanied by three. I walked back out of the office and watched four total men getting into a sleek looking Ram 1500, definitely four in total, and I was 99% certain that five had walked onto the lot. I stood there, wondering if my cop instincts were finally starting to fail me with age. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe there were only four of them. But if I was right, where was the fifth man? I decided to take a little walk around Lot 36, the unit that Manalo and his friends claimed to own. After all, it couldn't hurt to just take a look around, right? I got up, finished off the rest of the coffee that was purchased for me by the suspiciously friendly man, then walked around to Lot 36, and as soon as I was standing outside of it, I knew something was wrong. I trust that there aren't many people in the world who have witnessed an active murder scene before, and that can only be a good thing. If you have, there are certain things that always stay with you, and for me, it was the smell of blood. Hot blood smells like rust. That always struck me as a dumb sentence because it's not one that makes sense until you smell a lot of it, fresh from the source. But when you do smell a lot of it, that's just about the only word that covers it. It smells rusty. It's not a putrid smell, it doesn't make you gag or anything, but my god, once you smell it, you never forget it. And it's that hot, rusty smell that I smelled outside of Lot 36 that night. There was a hell of a lot of fresh blood somewhere, still warm due to the humid night air, and I was willing to bet on my mother's grave that it was inside of Lot 36. I immediately called 911, got connected with a police dispatcher, and told them exactly why I had my hunch. I explained who I was, told them I had decades of law enforcement experience, and that I needed uniformed officers as soon as physically possible. We kept bolt cutters on site so I could get the padlock off, but I needed the law on site to witness what was inside. Two officers showed up within the hour. I walked them over to the lot and explained the situation. It didn't take much explaining. One of the officers put his nose right up to the seam of the storage unit, took one whiff, and told me to bust it open. But when he did, that rusty coppery smell of fresh blood washed over us like a wave. The whole interior of the storage unit was covered in plastic sheets, which were in turn soaked in blood, and there were just two pieces of furniture. One was a long metal table with all kinds of bloody tools and instruments strewn on top of it. The other was what looked like a dentist chair with a broken, mutilated corpse strapped into it. For a minute or two, the three of us were hypnotized by just how horrifying the makeshift torture chamber actually was. In all my years in law enforcement, I'd never seen anything quite like it. Whoever had put it together had even bothered to partially soundproof the interior, probably for added peace of mind, although I believe it was the gag applied to the victim which really muffled their screams. I don't want to go into detail with regards to the kind of mutilations performed on the victim, but what I will do is assure you of one single thing. Whoever wanted that man dead wanted him to die very slowly and very painfully, ways that would make death seem like a mercy when it finally came. Within a few hours, there were dozens of cops wandering around the site with all kinds of forensic vehicles parked outside and they kept coming and going for almost a week after. I heard the story in the media, and a TV crew even visited on one of my days off to get some footage of the forensics team pouring over the scene, but after that, the media was low on details and it stayed like that for a while. A few months later I found myself thinking about the murder, so I got in touch with one of the younger co-workers who was still with the department. They told me it was cartel related, which I had already long suspected, but as the deputies pieced together the who's and why's of it, a deeply unsettling picture began to emerge. My old buddy told me that the friendly man who'd brought me coffee that night wasn't named Manalo and was more likely to be Luis Esparza, one of the Sinaloa cartel's men north of the border. Luis had sat down, talked antiquities, and drank coffee with me like a gentleman while his men tortured his own nephew to death in the storage unit at Lot 36. Word had come down from the FBI that they lost an informant in the Sinaloa's northern operation and it came down right about the same time we found the body. So, the department chiefs put two and two together and figured it was a cartel thing and that there was little point in taking it further because the killers were probably back south of the border already, a tale as old as time in my area of the country. 
You'd think that after almost four decades in law enforcement, I'd be more accustomed to the evils men can do to one another. But the way that cartel lieutenant could just sip coffee and talk history while knowing his own flesh and blood were being ripped apart and cut open while they were still alive. It takes a cold, cold heart to do something like that. It's inhuman, almost. I don't know if these people are crazy, or if the money makes them do these things, but I suspect a feeling of betrayal really motivated that young man's murder. They say blood runs thicker than water, but I can assure you, they made that boy bleed slow. After I got out of the army, a fellow ex-squaddy lined me up with a job as a security guard working for a regional contractor. They paid for me to get my SIA license, which is the bit of paper you need if you want to work security in the UK, and then after working with them for a while, I bounced from company to company, trying to work my way up the ladder. I ended up working for a major supermarket chain, which I dreaded at first, but I took to it more than I thought I would. It's a sociable job which suits me and considerably less dangerous than the army, but not exactly boring either, which was one of the main things I was worried about. I thought I'd be sat on my butt all day long, chasing kids off from pilfering streets or what have you, but it turns out that there were a couple of quite hair-raising moments too. Nothing too dodgy for the most part, but there was this one incident that was worse than anything I'd seen in the army, and I'd been to the bloody Falklands. This was mid-May of 1996, and I remember that because what I'm about to tell you happened just a few days after Manchester United beat Liverpool in the FA Cup final. My father-in-law, God rest his soul, was a Liverpool fan, and the sour face he had on the next day at Sunday dinner still makes me chuckle to this day. I was in the security office of this large supermarket, not sure I should say which one, and I must have been quite engrossed with whatever paperwork I was getting done because when my radio buzzed, it just about scared me half to death. It had been awful quiet, weekday afternoon and all, so I wasn't expecting anything major, but when I heard the voice coming through the static, I realized something bad was happening. I was coupled with this big, soft lad called Liam, the six-foot-something lummox who wasn't in the least bit phased by anything, and Liam sounded very nervous when he called for assistance on the radio that day. He told me that he was in the beer and wine section, which was right at the back of the store near the bakery, and that that meant that I had to walk all the way through the shop to get there. The closer I get, the more I can see some commotion coming from the beer and wine aisle. One woman even pushes her trolley up to me and starts begging me to go and help my colleague, saying that there was a scary man with no shoes on, threatening him with a bottle. I immediately get a jog on, turning into the beer and wine aisle to see Big Liam, facing down a man in a long coat. The woman was right in saying that he had no shoes on, but he also wore what was clearly a hospital gown, and I remember thinking that if it wasn't for the long coat, I'd probably be able to see the hospital tag on his wrist. The bloke was maybe in his late 20s or early 30s, and he kept telling Liam to keep away from him. Liam hadn't intended to go anywhere near the guy, as standard procedure called for two guards to be present during any attempt at neutralizing a threat. But then as I arrived, and as he started edging towards the guy with the intention of tackling him, he started grabbing bottles of spirits off the shelves and smashing them down in front of us. Since it was a clear and present danger to the customers, I told Liam to start clearing out the store and to enlist the help of the staff in order to do so. This obviously left me alone with our subject, but since he was evidently on the defensive, I reckoned that I'd be able to keep the situation contained until Liam had helped clear the area. In order to try and distract the man from any further violence of destruction of stock, I started to ask him what his problem was, in the nicest way possible, of course. I had no idea what kind of response he was going to give to that, but I reckoned it'd be something a bit loopy. After all, he was in his hospital gown, clearly having some kind of mental breakdown, so I didn't expect anything coherent out of what I assumed could well be a mental patient. But when he actually spoke, what he said sent chills through me. They put something inside me. I need to cut it. I need to get it out. I'm asking him what he meant by put something inside him and do he need to go back to the hospital. 
and I honestly thought listening to him and asking him questions would calm him down. Turns out my second question provoked a massively angry reaction in him. He started screaming, I'm not going back there, you can't make me, and all that, and he grabbed a bottle of something and hurled it down the aisle at me. It was a wild throw, so it didn't hit the target, but it was enough to make me back off a few meters while I assured him that no one was going to make him go anywhere. It was a lie, of course. Once he was in the hands of the police, they could do whatever they bloody well liked with him. But for the time being, I had to keep him from hurting anyone, as well as focusing on loss prevention. I focused on telling him that he wouldn't be going back to any hospital, and that all I wanted to do was make sure that he was okay, and after enough of that kind of talk, he seemed to relent a little bit. But then instead of calming down, the guy seemed to go completely the other way. To my horror, he started walking towards me, through all the broken glass on the floor. I started telling him, Hey, don't do that, you're going to hurt yourself. But he didn't listen, and the first crunch of glass under his foot made my skin crawl. I thought he'd jump back and fall on his butt. I mean, the pain must have been unimaginable. You've got all that broken glass cutting into him, and all the spirits on the ground, and they must have seeped into his cuts. But the weirdest thing was that he just didn't seem to feel any pain. He just kept walking, and as he did, he started tearing up. He said, I just need to get it out of me, in this wobbly voice that made it sound like he was about to cry, and then he just sat down among the booze and broken glass, which again made me wince like nobody's business. I kept asking what it was that was inside of him, and who we thought put it there, again, anything to distract him and make it seem like I genuinely cared. Don't get me wrong, I did care what happened to him. I'm only human after all, and the guy seemed to be actually suffering from something, clearly. He couldn't seem to give me an answer, though, and I'm not even sure if he was listening by that point because he kept pushing his fingers into his face and neck and arms. It looked like he was searching for something, something underneath his skin, and I guess that he was looking for whatever they had put inside him. God knows who they were, and I had no idea what he thought they'd put inside him. But he seemed really bloody convinced of it, and he proved beyond all doubt with his next action. When the bloke first picked up a large chunk of broken bottle, I thought that he might be planning on attacking me with it, so my first instinct was to back off from him even more. I told him to put it down, that there was no need for anyone to get hurt today. But again, he seemed to barely even hear me. I watched as he started prodding at one of his eyes, then he started whispering to himself, and then... Before I could get close enough to stop him, he started pushing a piece of broken bottle into the skin below his eyeball. All I could do was react. I nearly went bottom over top as I went through the giant puddle of spilt booze, but I made it to the other side, grabbed the arm that was holding the piece of glass, then wrenched it away from his face. If you remember, in his other hand was the bigger piece of broken bottle he was holding by the neck and he got a couple of decent swipes at my leg before I was able to circle around and drag him away from the broken glass. I remember hearing some screams from the people who hadn't been properly moved out of the area, and realizing that there was uh, quite a lot of blood trailing along the floor from where I was dragging the guy. I didn't really know what I was going to do from there. It was all just a short-term solution to a problem of the bloke wanting to harm himself, but luckily, he took care of the biggest problem for me. In order to be able to find his feet again, the guy had to let go of the broken bottle to use his one free hand to get a bit of balance. That gave me a golden opportunity to drag him away from it before flooring him again, then after pinning his arms down, I was able to basically sit on his chest until Liam came back to give me a hand. I was hoping he might have tired himself out, but no, the whole time he was bucking and writhing and I don't know if it was the adrenaline, but he was much stronger than he looked. Honestly, if Liam hadn't gotten back when he did, I'm not sure I'd have been able to hold him for much longer. He was completely manic, still up for a fight despite all his injuries. He kept saying all this really distressing stuff too, saying I was with them, whoever they were, and if I had any kids that I should kill them because they'd be coming for them next. I told them I had no idea who they were and I swear to God he says to me, but now they know you and that means you're effed. I know the guy was off in his head and that I shouldn't have paid attention to anything he was saying, but, but in the moment, thinking about my daughter, 
Some of that stuff really got to me in my head. Eventually, the police did turn up, and we helped get the bloke into cuffs and into their van. He was kicking and spitting the whole way, but in the end, the job was a good one, and we were back to the office to wipe ourselves down with antiseptic wipes before we, we filled out incident reports. And that, boys and girls, was the single worst incident I'd ever dealt with, and I was on duty for the riots back in 2011. That was just mob rule, something I could understand given how young and scummy the rioters tended to be, but what happened that day with the guy in the hospital gown has stayed with me for decades. We never found out what the matter with him was, or if he ended up getting better. But I suppose that's life, isn't it? Just a series of unanswered questions. But what I've figured out is that there's some that I'd rather not know the answer to. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Right after I dropped out of college, my life sucked. And to support myself, I had to get this temp job working overnight security for a hotel. It was maybe only five weeks of work before the permanent guy came back after surgery or something, but it kept me afloat while my parents were on my back to pay them rent. Harsh, but fair. Working there was mostly uneventful, especially during the later hours, but after a while, the lack of sunlight really started getting to me. I'd start at 11pm, do a few walks around, help empty the bar out when it closed, then I was generally free to watch late night TV and raid the kitchen for pastries, then watch the sun come up on the roof before clocking out at around 6.30 in the morning. The five weeks went by like a breeze, and it was literally my last shift before I started a new job when I went through one of the most heart-pounding incidents of my young life. Everything was going smoothly until just after 6am when the front desk calls me on my radio and says there is a noise complaint from one of the occupied rooms. Apparently, the guest clock radio alarm had been going off for almost 20 minutes straight and it was angering a lot of the neighboring rooms to the point that they were calling the front desk to complain. To add to it, the front desk tells me the room requested a wake-up call 30 minutes before and hadn't answered multiple attempts to call. I tell them I'll go check it out. Then I start heading up to the room with Ted, the maintenance guy, joining me just in case. We get to the door and sure enough, the alarm clock is blaring full volume, one of those really annoying old style ones too. I can hear the phone in the room ringing too, the big heavy older type phone with an actual bell in it so I could totally understand why people were up in arms about all the noise. I knock on the door and shout over the noise, no answer. I pound on the door, no answer. I dip my key card and start to open the door and that's when I realize that the upper latch is still connected. I immediately freeze. I guess I had unconsciously assumed that the room was empty, given the volume of noise in the room, but the security latch can only be closed by someone in the room. My mind starts racing. I use a card to pop the security latch, then open the door, and laying face down on the bed, half covered by a bed sheet, is a middle-aged man and it didn't look like he was breathing. I look at the maintenance guy who gives me a look that says, what do you want me to do? I enter the room and say, excuse me sir, in the loudest voice I can muster, loud enough to be heard over the alarm and the phone, just praying for him to wake up and for everything to be fine. But I get nothing, no response. It sounds crazy, but even though I kind of figured that he was dead, I gave it one more try, out of pure wishful thinking. I get next to the bed, and then much louder this time I shout, excuse me sir, reaching out to grab the dude's hairy shoulder and shake it while I shout again, excuse me sir, as loud as I can. Suddenly, the guy lifts his head up, looks at me confused while we explain that we thought he was dead. It turns out, he was just trashed and didn't hear any of his alarms, then asks us in slurs if we could turn off the alarm for him. We oblige, walk out of the room, and breathed a sigh of relief. Thinking that guy was dead and then thinking that me, a 19 year old, was now somehow responsible for him, that was the scariest feeling of my life up to that point. I'd never done CPR, barely listened in the first aid lessons we gotten in high school and for a second, I really thought it was going to be all on me to save that guy's life. Thankfully that wasn't the case, but feeling so unprepared bothered me so much that 
I think that incident became the catalyst for me actually becoming a man and not acting like a kid anymore. Nothing like a brush with mortality to make you realize that we've only got so much time on the clock, and so you better not waste it. I used to work security for a downtown high-rise condo, and without a doubt, the worst thing about the job were the jumpers. The number of people that took their own life while I was there was haunting. There were roughly four per year in the eight years that I worked there. The worst one for me was this little old lady. She went to the top floor and jumped, fell through a tree and splattered into the sidewall. She left a body-sized hole in the tree. The fire department came to hose off the sidewalk. Little did they know a good-sized chunk of her liver was under the parked car she landed next to. It wasn't found until the next morning when that person left and the liver was just sitting there. Her sons had to fly in to take care of her estate. On the table in the dining room was a note. She explained that because they weren't going to visit her that year, she didn't need to exist anymore, and they both broke down sobbing when they read that. We almost had to put them on watch, and over the next three weeks they would come into the office and demand the security footage that shows their mom going into the elevator, getting out at the top floor and throwing herself off, then landing on the ground. Our general manager and attorney both refused to release this footage to their sons. That stuff still haunts me to this day. Those loud, deep sobs of just pure sorrow those grown men let out will forever be in my memory. I was a security guard at a homeless shelter here in the city. We had a regular who came around our property named Leon. He would, for the most part, be cooperative and move along if he was asked. One day I found him slouched over and not looking great, so I asked him if he was doing okay. He said yes, but didn't respond in the greatest way, so I asked if he needed help or if he was on or drinking anything today. He said just drinking as usual, and as I got closer, I noticed that there was what looked like blood on his hat. I put on some gloves and got in close, pulling his hat off to find that Leon had a massive gash on his skull roughly eight inches long and completely covered in maggots. This man had roughly 20 to 30 maggots covering his gash just eating away. Naturally, I called 911 and got some assistance from medical professionals and made sure to warn them beforehand. Both of them were mortified when we brought them to him, but they still took him off to get some help. I haven't seen Leon since then, and I just hope that he's doing okay. Working security can really bring some strange moments. I used to work security at a strip mall here in Texas. The mall was owned by some company who rented the units to the various businesses, but hired us as security for the whole thing. This meant we were in control of all the security cameras as well as the footage and it was through this that I helped a gentleman recover videos from our DVR system. Long story short, it showed him shooting three men that tried to rob his store. And it went kind of like this. The store owner is behind the counter just doing his thing, then the three robbers burst into his store. Two of the men run for the beer section while a third points a gun at the guy. And then as soon as the two kids grab the beer and start running for the door, the third kid drops his gun. Yep, Butterfingers drops his pistol, and there's this perfect oh crap look on his face. In that instant, the store owner pulls out a shotgun from behind the counter and just starts blasting. You see the first kid go down right outside the door on both the cameras as they were pointed at the inside of the door and the ones outside. The third kid begins shooting wildly in the general direction of the guy after picking his gun up again, but he doesn't hit anything besides display shelves. Store owner hits the floor, then comes back up with a shotgun and opens fire on the shooter who goes down halfway out of the store, basically clogging the doorway up. The last robber is trying to make a dash out the door, but his buddy's body slows him and the clerk chases him, shooting him down in the parking lot. The kid with the gun died, while the first kid who got shot survived. I don't remember what happened to the one that took the closest shotgun glass, but I don't think he died either. Unreal to think about, but... I guess that's life. 
The whole thing happened so fast it's all over in just a few seconds when you watch the video. But the thing that really creeped me out was the way the store owner acted while watching the whole thing back. I know he was entitled to defend himself and that no one should have to apologize for it. But I don't know. If that was me, I wouldn't be so celebratory about it. It seemed like he enjoyed knowing that he killed the one kid. It didn't seem to faze him at all. I guess there's some folks out there who are better than killing than others. And I don't care what anyone says. That's just straight up creepy to me. I work security at a nuclear power station, which means we're real close to a river. Our cameras have some decent zoom capabilities and we've seen a few things get in on the shore on the other side of the river. The most interesting thing I think would be the deer and the coyotes. A pack of coyotes chased a deer around in the frozen river until it fell on the water right next to our intake. Well, it froze to death with just the neck and head sticking above the ice. The coyotes lost interest but a mother and baby bobcat would come every other night and just gnaw on it. Every time I'd zoom in on it just to see how it was doing, it would creep me out. Just this frozen deer head staring back at you from across the lake. Sounds dumb, but even from that distance away, it felt like it was looking at you. It was just how powerful the zoom on our camera was, but still, that little incident definitely stuck with me for all those years. This was almost 10 years ago now, and I have since left the security industry, but I'm not naming any names in order to protect the innocent. This happened on the very night of my very first post. I had to do fire watch, which was basically what we called the night shift at this ultra-scummy two-story hotel that had about 40 rooms to it. The entire hotel was condemned because of the back stair set that separated each floor was about to collapse. Code enforcement and fire department condemned it. Anyway... My job was to get everyone out of the hotel to move to another hotel the owner had. The entire place was full of mostly crackheads and near homeless people trying to survive and making weekly payments. The parking lot was full of junky cars not running. It was run down and derelict. It was something out of a movie, bad part of Stockton, California in the middle of the summer. Needles everywhere around the property and, oh my god, the roaches. The cockroaches these rooms had. I had to knock on every door with a code enforcement guy, I wore a body cam as well, and a fire department guy. Everyone that answered the door to their rooms was clearly an addict and not all there. I remember knocking on the door of a woman's room. She had five kids in there with her, single mom and trash bags piled to the ceiling inside, and cockroaches crawling everywhere. It was a horrible sight. Every single occupant had four hours to get what they can carry and leave. Most of them tried to pack up their lives, but they couldn't. A lot of stuff was left behind in these rooms. So many people asked me for help or what they need to do, and I didn't have answers. I was just the guy needing everyone out. I couldn't believe the living conditions these people lived in to keep from being on the streets, and it made me realize what I had. I burned my pants and boots when I got home. I washed my uniform shirt about six times. I threw my gloves away. I was so scared to bring cockroaches home to my own home. Millions upon millions of roaches infested this place, and they all slept in it. And it makes my skin crawl to think about, even all these years later. I've been a security guard for the past seven years. For my first four years, I worked at this really, really old factory, like over a hundred years old, something like that. Two creepy things have happened to me. The first one happened at around 1 a.m. on a weeknight. There wasn't a single person in the plant except my coworker who was in the office. I was doing my rounds and I approached a kind of back corner of the building. There's a door that I'm supposed to go out, take a look around, and come back in. As I approached the door, the lights around said door went completely out. So basically there was around 40 feet of darkness in front of me and my entire body froze instantly and I could not for the life of me convince myself to walk through said darkness. Second thing, a little explaining is needed. When I leave the office, there's a door I used to leave, and immediately to the left is a hallway which I used to start my rounds. I take a left down that hallway, but there's a door to the right that goes into a small side parking lot that is always empty, 
Only the owners and other VIPs parked there during the day since I worked at night and it was always empty. Now anyways, I'm coming out of the office, look down at my phone and put on music. Boom. The door to the right slammed shut. I mean like it made me jump out of my boots. Of course, my coworker was on rounds. I walked out to the door and nobody. I walked out into the parking lot. Nobody. Up the stairs immediately inside said door. Nobody. I couldn't explain it. I have since left this site because, just straight up, nope. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.